to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, so there's a popular class of compounds that we haven't really talked about yet, and you can probably guess what they are judging by the title of the video. So we've touched on them in the Compounds for Hair Loss video, but other than that, you'd be pressed to find them on my channel. And these are the follistatin proteins, which appear to have been around for some time and banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency, and so it's worthy of a deeper dive to see if they truly are the tool for muscle proliferation that some people may feel that they are. So endogenous folistatin is a single chain glycoprotein known to inhibit the transforming growth factor beta superfamily ligands. And although initially isolated from the ovarian follicle in the late 80s and found to inhibit follicle stimulating hormone, it's been found to be expressed in various tissue types. And we're talking about endogenous folistatin here. So the TGF beta family signaling pathway is involved in many different processes determining the fate of stem cells, parts of development, components of immunity, and even certain disease processes as we'll come to know. And we can get more into these details if you'd like, but for the purpose of the video, it's worth jumping straight into the synthetic protein products, the things that people inject. But before we do, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Couldn't imagine a universe where 6,000 people would be interested in peptide-derived research, but I guess crazier things have happened and you're support means a lot to me and I appreciate it in advance. Thank you. Moving on. Now you'll see that folistatin is synthesized into different isoforms. So there's folistatin 315, folistatin 344, which describe the number of amino acids present. And although there are other components at play, which we'll touch on, the big draw of folistatin products is the antagonism of myostatin, which is one of the many members of this TGA beta superfamily. Myostatin is a protein that assists in regulation of muscle mass and limits the number of muscle fibers present, and it's expressed in developing an adult skeletal muscle specifically. And there are popular photos actually of cows that have genetic mutations in activating the myostatin gene, making them absolutely jacked, and they're called double-muscled cattle because they have quite literally dysregulated production of muscle. So the idea behind injecting compounds that resemble polystatin proteins and antagonize myostatin is obviously to become big, to increase muscle mass and subsequently strength. But when we think about clinical utility, muscle wasting and degenerative conditions come to mind, but let's put that aside for now and see what the data says. Let's start off by saying that the action of folistatin is essentially through preventing myostatin and another protein called activin from binding to what are called type 2 activin receptors. And in a nutshell, activation of this pathway stimulates muscle degradation and features of muscle wasting. Therefore, blocking the pathway would lead to the reverse, which is muscle hypertrophy. And some preclinical findings were that when an adeno-associated virus serotype 1, known as AAV1, expressing the human folistatin-344 transgene that encodes the 135 isoform was injected into older mice, there were visualized increases in muscle mass and strength. And these similar results were echoed when it was injected into the quadricep muscle of the macaque monkey. So in essence, these findings refer to studies where researchers used a specific type of virus, adeno-associated virus serotype 1, to deliver genetic material into the muscles of mice and primates. And in the 2010s, a tiny biotech company based out of Ohio ran with the research for utility in people with degenerative diseases and tested out Folistatin 344 via quadricep injection in six people with Becker muscular dystrophy. And although a low sample size limited study, the results were that some could walk further and some could not with histological results exhibiting some benefit with regards to hypertrophic changes. And it was generally well tolerated over a significant amount of time. But we're going to get back to this study later. So the initial investigation showed promise for further research. This prompted drug designation for orphan status in 2016 for inclusion body myositis. And as we've talked about before on the channel with a couple other compounds, orphan drug status is when a compound is approved for use in very specific, rarer patient populations of less than 200,000 people. And this designation has seven years of market exclusivity. And although there was initially hype, investors, and promise, this smaller startup, Myo Biotech, appeared to have faced some sort of issue 
issues which are not uncommon in these smaller pharmaceutical spaces, and as such, the company no longer exists. So I will admit that there is little we know about the exogenous utilization of folostatin in humans, and there was question about if the research evaluated in mice and monkeys was translational to not only humans but also to muscle diseases. And the clinical evaluation of that was only in six people before the core market player, this Milo Biotechnology Company, was taken out of the space. And this, in and of itself, was controversial. There's actually a whole published article from 2017 questioning the validity of this study alone. It's quite sassy, and it's the research equivalent of throwing hands. I quote, the frequency of falls in this trial was 33% of the patients, and without data indicating this was not excessive, the publication's conclusion that folostatin gene therapy is, quote-unquote, unequivocally safe is premature. Oh, snap. And something I'm curious about is the relationship between folostatin presence and different disease states like cancer. Because TGF-beta possesses this paradox, where it's thought to be a tumor suppressor in early-stage cancer and a promoter in later stages. So would giving an inhibitor of some of the factors be vaguely either pro or against the spread of cancer? I'm really not not sure, and neither are many people. And on top of that, elevated serum folostatin appears to be a common feature of different cancer types, but it's unclear whether this is due to the milieu of chronic disease or if it stems from the cancer itself. And I do think a lot of the hype surrounding folostatin ignores its vague and unclear relationship with cancer, as some research shows folostatin may inhibit tumor angiogenesis, while in others, elevated serum folostatin is correlated with poor prognosis. So to clarify what I mean about the lack of clarity, let's take a look at a quote from a review that came out of Cancer Genomics and Proteomics. As an antagonist of Activin, FST or folostatin seems primarily to function depending on the role that activin plays, exerting context-dependent and cell-type-specific inhibition and activation, including a stimulating effect observed in activation of the FST-stimulating effect on gastric and prostate cancers while playing an inhibitory role in gonadal tumors. See, quite vague and filled with an unknown that, in my opinion, is quite important. Not to mention we only have the smallest of clinical trials, Phase 1 at that, assessing utilization, safety, efficacy in humans, and those with a rare deleterious muscular condition at that. So are the results with the general population translational? Are they dose-dependent? Have the risks been well investigated enough to craft an analysis of what to expect and what are the possible outcomes, adverse or otherwise? All questions that I like to have answers to, but perhaps that just me. And all of this is just compounded by the fact that the study of the six individuals with Becker's muscular dystrophy is popularly unpopular. So as we can see at this point, it's very interesting with a fascinating mechanism of action, that's for sure, and I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it as well given the multifarious nature of the TGF-beta superfamily. However, our understanding of these peptides themselves that exist in these popular isoforms is quite minimal. I'm not going to lie, and especially judging by the amount of research in humans too, quite unknown. That said, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's one we haven't talked about yet. If you do want to get into any other topics with regards to folostatin in general, as well as other peptides you're interested in, just let me know. Leave a comment below. On top of that, the link to the Patreon will be in the description too. This is a good community for us to discuss different peptides and make really specific videos based off your own requests too. But most importantly, above all else, Thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.